I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Alka Chandana, who will be our first speaker. And Alka serves as the vice president of laboratory investigations cases at PETA. She ran PETA's campaign against Columbia University, calling for an end to a number of cruel experiments. She spearheaded PETA's efforts to exhort laboratory oversight bodies that are called um, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees, or IACUC committees, committees, to fulfill their legally mandated responsibilities. That is, there are laws that we have on the books in the US to restrict the use of animals in testing, but they're not being enforced. So ALCA has written dozens of complaints against labs for violations of the Federal Animal Welfare Act, which have led to the US Department of Agriculture to cite these facilities. In 2010, after she wrote PETA's complaint against professional laboratory and research services, um, the North Carolina contract-based animal research, animal testing facility surrendered nearly 200 dogs and more than 50 cats and shut its doors. Recently, she worked on PETA's successful campaign to end a series of maternal deprivation experiments on monkeys at the National Institutes of Health. She has had original research published in peer-reviewed journals on policies pertaining to problems with oversights of animal experimentation. Before coming to PETA, Alka served for five years as a tenured professor of mathematics at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. Um, and before we start with Alka, I'll also just go ahead and introduce to us um, Mohit Jain, who will be um, looking for questions and moderating um, questions from the audience. Mohit Jain um, is a um, member of the Jain community, grew up um, you know, with, uh, with all of the Bachala and Derasar uh, uh, teachings of Jainism and in his family and home with, with leaders in the Jain community close at hand. After working in the corporate world, he realized his lifelong obsession with fast food was causing harm to his body. And he went from a, a fast food connoisseur to health crusader, maintaining a regular lifestyle through proper nutrition, daily exercise, and regular meditation. The Jain values that Mohit grew up with motivated him to contribute to Jain organizations and others that are not explicitly Jain, but in line with our values, such as mercy for animals. And so I'd like to hand it over to Alka to, for her presentation, and then we can transition over to Mohit for some questions and comments. And for the audience members, you can put questions in the chat at any time. We'll have a time at the very end where we can have you um, uh, go ahead and unmute, um, and we may we have some time in between to unmute, but please feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat box to see um, what your thoughts are as we go along. Take it away, Alka. Thank you everyone for uh, sharing part of your Saturday uh, morning or if you're on the East Coast like I am afternoon uh, with me and the others. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to uh, have this conversation. Um, just to give you a bit of uh, additional background to what uh, Gina said, um, uh, and how I ended up at PETA, I guess, is uh, that like I think many of us, uh, I grew up vegetarian and uh, I'm Hindu. And uh, uh, although we didn't talk about animals explicitly in our house, um, as far as what our relationship was with other animals, um, I would notice that, for example, if there was a spider or other small animal in our house, like an insect, um, my mother wouldn't go to the default that we often see with people where they just kill the animal. You know, she would take a, a, a dustbin and pick up the animal, the spider insect, and take that um, that little, little being outside so he or she could live out his or her life peacefully. Uh, and that made an impression. Um, but I didn't really think about animal rights. I didn't know what that was or any of these other issues um, explicitly. Uh, although I remember that at some point in high school, a friend of mine asked if I would ever wear a fur coat, and um, I said no. Uh, later on, when I was an undergraduate, I was I used to write for a student paper, um, and uh, this was in Canada. And in Canada, all of the student papers belong to a consortium of papers called Canadian University Press, uh, and when an individual paper didn't have enough articles to fill its pages, we would snap up an article from another paper. And uh, one such article that was snapped up was on animal experimentation. And uh, I had um, 
you know, I was a progressive student on campus. I was interested in issues like nuclear disarmament, women's rights, uh, obviously poverty uh, and concerns about the global south. And, uh, but, but these issues uh, brought to my attention by this article on animal experimentation, you know, the fact that animals uh, were being used in cosmetics testing in very cruel, deadly experiments, uh, that there were curiosity driven experiments happening at universities like my own. Um, was a bit of a wake up call to me. I didn't know that these things were going on. It shook me up. And especially thinking about animal experimentation, you know, this idea that people who were like me, people who had uh, had that advantage of a very good education, were yet making this decision to harm vulnerable beings, uh, these other beings. And that made me, for the first time, think, what is our relationship with the other animals? Who are they? Uh, you know, how should we be interacting with them? And so what became, you know, a religious adherence, you know, that I didn't eat meat, um, and we were lacto-vegetarians, uh, became uh, something that was, became my own, something that I felt very deeply uh, as far as my own personal ethics were concerned. Um, so a couple of months later, I was sitting uh, with um, the editor of that student paper, who was a friend of mine, and I said, you know, Kevin, somebody really needs to write another article about that animal issue. It seems very important to me. And he said, like a good editor, why don't you? And so I started looking into the issue myself. And one of the things that I did uh, in my investigations um, was go to the library. And I uh, found a copy of Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, which many people consider to be like a, the Bible of the animal rights movement. And um, I read that and I was convinced that just as I was concerned about social justice uh, for human beings, um, similarly, animal issues uh, were part of that fabric of social justice that we had to consider animals as part of the, so, the, the moral universe. Um, so, uh, uh, I have this title, Animal Experimentation, the Blackest of All Black Crimes, and some of you may recognize uh, this quote. It's from Mahatma Gandhi, who uh, characterized vivisection, which is animal experimentation, as being the blackest of all black crimes that humanity perpetrates against uh, other animals. Um, so what I'd like to chat about in the next few minutes, um, just very quickly, uh, some of the key points uh, why should we care about animal experimentation? Well, there's animal rights, uh, animal welfare. Uh, the issue, as Gina alluded to, uh, legal protections for animals, the fact that there's a legal double standard. Uh, because my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Aisha Akhtar is here, I won't be talking about scientific uh, failures or human relevant research methods because she has written the book and many published papers on this issue. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, deign to know more than she does because she is certainly an expert there. But uh, to proceed then, animal rights. Um, this is PETA's mission statement. Animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, use for entertainment or abuse in any other way. And uh, you know the mission statement comes out of our knowledge, the scientific, scientific fact that animals feel pain, they feel loneliness, they feel pleasure and happiness, uh, love for their compatriots. Uh, and because they have these abilities, because they are sentient, uh, because they can suffer, you know, these are the, the uh, aspects of animals that we should be considering when we determine or decide whether or not we should harm them. Um, and so this is really the underlying uh, principle that undergirds the concept of animal rights or animal liberation, that animals matter. They are subjects in their own lives, just as we are subjects in ours. So some of you may have seen that there was a cat on my lap a little bit earlier. Uh, her name is Angie. Um, Angie, like all other animals, human or non-human, she has interests. Um, I would never do this, but if I were to hit her, she would have an interest in not being hit. 
you know, if I were to put her outside and leave her there, she has an interest, you know, in coming inside if it's cold outside. Um, so these are interests that we have to consider. Uh, and the idea of animal rights is that these are the interests that we should uh, be respecting, again, when we think about what our relationship is with the other animals. Uh, you know, and the bottom line is that just because we can take animals from their homes in the forest or in nature or from the sea or wherever they may live, or just because we can breed them into existence, just because we have that power, it doesn't give us the right to uh, inflict those harms on animals, you know, throw them into a cage and inflict any and every abuse that we can imagine. And frankly, abuses that none of us who are gathered here today would ever imagine. Uh, so that's animal rights. Um, and, you know, I mentioned animals are sentient. Uh, I'll just uh, give a shout out to this report that we um, put out, I believe it was last month. Um, my colleague Ingrid Taylor, who's a veterinarian, uh, prepared this authoritative look at the research on animal sentience, what we know about animal sentience. There are now more than 2,500 studies that document the fact that animals feel pain, they suffer, they have an emotional um, uh, dimension, they have uh, psychological needs, you know, just all of that. And we're talking about, of course, non-human primates, but all the way to various invertebrates, uh, cephalopods and so on. Um, so I I'd encourage you to check it out. I, if you just typed PETA.org sentience, you would get to the sentience report. Um, but also animal welfare. Uh, and for this, we need to understand what happens to animals in laboratories. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken uh, during a PETA undercover investigation at a contract testing laboratory called Covance. This particular laboratory was in Vienna, Virginia. It's now been shut down, uh, although Covance continues to operate. But what we see here in this photograph is a small glimpse into the lives of these animals. Um, the cages that you see back here, uh, this is where those monkeys live for their entire lives. Uh, these are sterile, austere conditions, barren cages, barely bigger than the bodies of the animals. They can take one or two steps in any direction. Um, you know, they're given these mirrors, you know, as what they call enrichment, which strikes me as a very odd word to use when you're talking about lives of utter impoverishment. They're often caged by themselves, even though monkeys, like human beings, are social beings. Uh, for monkeys to be caged alone in, in this type of social deprivation is like what it is for us to be held in um, solitary confinement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an extreme form of deprivation and frankly, torture, psychological torture. Um, and of course, it's not just that the animals are held like that in these horrible conditions where they're deprived of anything and everything that would make their lives worth living, but it, indeed it's also that uh, they are used in experiments that can be painful, uh, cause extreme distress, and uh, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, the animals are killed after they've been used in the experiments. Um, you can get a sense of how uh, devastating this sort of life is for the animals. Um, if you look at this monkey here, uh, you can maybe make out that his inner arm, um, he has a sore, and this is from his self-biting. So he is actually uh, carrying out self-injurious behaviors because he has no control over what happens to him in his life. So the only thing he can control is things like pulling out his hair or biting his own flesh. And this is what happens in laboratories. Um, there's a lot of data out there about uh, self-injurious behavior with animals and not only monkeys who we all know are intelligent um, and uh, profoundly social beings, but with mice and rats and other animals, even fishes. Um, here uh, we see a dog uh, uh, whose name was Peony um, and she was killed in a laboratory at Texas A&M University. Um, she and her uh, and other dogs like her were deliberately bred 
to have canine muscular dystrophy. This is a painful and debilitating condition, which is ultimately deadly. And if the animals uh, don't die in their cages, as many animals did die in the cages over the 40 year period that these experiments have been carried out, uh, if they don't die in their cages, they are killed at the end of the experiment. Uh, these animals, because of the condition that is deliberately induced into them through that breeding, uh, they have difficulty eating, they have difficulty swallowing, they have difficulty breathing. Their lives are characterized by unmitigated misery from the moment they're born to the moment they're killed. Um, so it's, it's an issue of animal welfare being compromised. And what you see here is where Peony lived. Again, austere, barren conditions. They didn't even give the dogs blankets because they didn't want um, that to uh, interfere with the, uh, the, the drainage system of water when the water was sprayed on the cages. Uh, the fact that these are animals, that they are not inanimate objects, uh, that they feel pain, they suffer, that their lives matter, that concept is not existing in laboratories today. Um, and I don't want to leave out the mice and rats. Mice and rats who are small, who many of us don't necessarily understand, who we may even be afraid of, um, but who feel pain and suffer just as much as the monkeys and dogs and cats and other animals with whom we're familiar. Uh, so this is a photograph from Cleveland Clinic, and this was an investigation that we carried out um, um, last year in 2020. And what we found were hideous violations of animal welfare uh, guidelines. But um, I should say that here in this photograph, what you see is that these particular um, mice were bred to have, uh, a ki have kidney disease. And uh, through that breeding, uh, one of the symptoms of the kidney disease is that they would have, um, they would lose a lot of fur and they would have sores all over their bodies. Now, all of that is perfectly legal, I should say that. Um, but again, you know, these animals are really regarded as test tubes with tails. Basically, they're regarded as inanimate objects. And the idea is because we are mighty, you know, the idea is might makes right. Because we have the power to do the, this to these animals, we do it. You know, and at the end of the experiments, the animals are killed if they didn't die uh, you know, during the course of the experiment. I'm just gonna show a very quick video. It's just an hour, uh, not an hour, it's just a minute and 39 seconds. And I, I will tell you, some of these images are gonna be hard to look at. Nothing is really gory, it's just sad. But you, if you don't wanna watch it, you can look away, uh, um, but I'll just play. The sound is not coming through, but I think this oh, no. make it even okay. harder for people. So I, we can we can read the text and watch the images. Thank you. Thanks.
Uh, thank you for watching that. Now, the thing to know about the use of animals in laboratories is that everything that I've shown you to this point, um, the monkeys at Covance, the uh, dog at Texas A&M University, um, the experiments at Cleveland Clinic, uh, the monkeys who you just saw in the last uh, video from the National Primate Research Centers and National Institutes of Health, all of that treatment of animals is perfectly legal. Uh, there are uh, some legal protections for animals in laboratories. They're codified um, in the Animal Welfare Act. This is the Animal Welfare Act and it's implementing regulations. Um, but the Animal Welfare Act and its implementing regulations, it's largely about husbandry. Uh, animals have to be fed once a day. They have to be given water. They have to um, uh, be kept in cages that are of a certain dimension. Um, keep in mind the cages that you saw with the monkeys, that is legal. The shoebox style cages for mice and rats, that is legal. Um, the Animal Welfare Act actually excludes from coverage the great majority, more than 95% of animals used in laboratories. It excludes mice of the genus Mus, rats of the genus Ratus, amphibians, reptiles, fishes, birds who are bred for experimentation, and farmed animals uh, used in agricultural experimentation. Uh, so, so the Animal Welfare Act ba barely covers uh, you know, the smallest uh, subset of animals used in laboratories. Um, and even to the extent that these animals who are covered like monkeys, dogs, cats, and so on, um, even those animals who are covered are still very vulnerable. Uh, there are requirements for veterinary care, um, but if any kind of veterinary treatment or analgesia pain relief uh, is going to interfere with the scientific objectives of the experiment, uh, the experimenter uh, is within his or her rights to say, I'm not going to use analgesia, I'm not going to provide veterinary care, and that's okay. Um, so there's a lack of legal protections. You might be thinking that you often read in the newspaper that, for example, somebody may have um, hit their dog or, uh, uh, you know, done something horrible that I won't mention, uh, but you see it in the papers, awful things that people do uh, where they're, to they, they're torturing dogs or cats or uh, other animals out, you know, out in society. And you see that, you know, they get felony level cruelty to animals charges posted against them. They might go to jail. They might have a fine uh, posted against them. Um, and you might say, well, doesn't that apply to animals in laboratories? And the fact is, uh, in most states, it doesn't. These state anti-cruelty statutes that prohibit uh, uh, this um, uh, mistreatment of animals uh, when it happens outside of a laboratory, those anti-cruelty statutes in the majority of the states do not apply to laboratories. There is an exemption. Um, so we had this billboard, if you call it medical research, you can get away with murder. Um, so. As I said, uh, Dr. Aisha Akhtar will be talking about the scientific issues related to animal experimentation, but I do want to give a shout out to um, the scientists who work at PETA. Um, and uh, recently we released uh, something called the Research Modernization Deal. Again, if you Google PETA.org uh, research modernization, you will get to this report. It's an authoritative report um, that talks about the limitations of uh, the use of animals in experimentation and what some of the uh, replacement methodologies are. Uh, now we come to the most important thing, what you can do. Um, and here are a few things. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to join PETA's action team, um, then you will re receive alerts on our campaigns, whether it's animal experimentation or the other areas where PETA works, animals used for food, um, animals used for clothing, uh, animals used in entertainment and animal experimentation, as well as companion animal issues and so on. So you can just go to PETA, join the action team, um, PETA.org, and you can uh, receive alerts, become informed of the campaigns and take action. Uh, we encourage people to share information about the plight of animals in laboratories and really anywhere where animals are exploited because the reason these things go on uh, is because people don't know that this is happening. Um, you know, I'm shocked uh, at how many times I hear from people who I meet, you know, um, pre-COVID <laughs> when I would be out and about. I'm just shocked by how many times I would hear from people 
uh, that they thought that these sorts of things were illegal in the United States, um, but but that's just not true. As I've uh, detailed, you know, all of these horrors are going on. They're legal. They're happening, and they happen because they happen behind locked doors. So you know, our challenge is to open those laboratory doors so that people can see what's going on. The way we do it is through undercover investigations, and then we publicize videos and so on. Um, you know, uh, my two sisters are medical doctors. I, of course, uh, didn't become the useful type of doctor. You know, I went into mathematics. <laughs> but, um, but we do have many uh, people who are experts in biological sciences, our medical doctors, um, who uh, are primatologists, who have other expertise, veterinarians, and so on, geneticists. Uh, and we have a database of expert advisors. So in addition to uh, looking at our own scientists, I'm getting um, critiques, preparing critiques of experiments that are going on. We really uh, like to have expert advisors who can also help us so that we can communicate effect effectively to the public why experiments on animals don't work. Um, you know, Aisha has helped us so many times and we are always so grateful to her. Um, and, you know, I want to, because this uh, webinar came about because of COVID-19, I just want to chat quickly about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we at PETA, uh, our uh, credo is not only that animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, or use in entertainment. Uh, you know the way uh, we make our, you know, we make our way in the world, the way we navigate the world, which is an extremely non-vegan world, an extremely exploitive world when it comes to our treatment of animals, is uh, the basic principle is where you can make a choice, always make the compassionate choice. So, you know, we, we, we therefore practice a vegan lifestyle, which means, um, you know, we don't eat animals, we don't wear animals, we don't uh, uh, give our money to people who exploit animals for entertainment. Um, you know, to the extent that it's possible, we choose vegan options in our medication. So for example, I had the flu shot earlier this year um, and the flu shot that I took is the vegan one because that option exists. So where there's an option, we choose the vegan one. The thing to know about the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, a couple of things to know, uh, as, as um, Gina mentioned earlier, it does not include uh, it does not directly include animal ingredients, although there is that whole thing with the uh, feli, uh, fetal bovine serum, which is awful, uh, and alternatives are being made. Um, with the COVID-19 vaccine, although normally all medications, whether it's pharmaceutical drugs, vaccines, other things, any medication, because as Gina said, the Food and Drug Administration or comparable agencies around the world, because they require testing on animals, all of these things are being tested on animals. With COVID-19, because of the emergency situation of the pandemic, both the FDA and the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, agreed that we could sidestep uh, this testing on animals. Um, what ended up happening is that some of these companies like Pfizer, Moderna, did animal tests concurrent at the same time as clinical tests in human beings. So animals were still used and abused and killed um, in the testing, uh, but not as many as would have happened otherwise. Um, so at PETA, we have a, a, a department called the Regulatory Testing Division, and its whole purpose um, is to work with regulatory bodies uh, to get them to agree to using non-animal test methods rather than, uh, rather than animal tests. And so they've been working with the FDA and EPA and other agencies and the global agencies uh, for about 15 years now. And slowly <laughs> we're seeing a move away from uh, the requirement that animals be used. So in the whole realm of animal tests that are required, some tests you know, for some tests, replacements are being validated and approved by the agencies. Um, so we think that that's a very good thing. And we also think that with this 
uh, pandemic and the fact that the FDA and the NIH had said that um, tests could be circumvented, uh, we're hopeful that this will be you know, the moment where um, the whole world agrees that it's not just with the COVID-19 vaccines, but with other vaccines and other pharmaceuticals that we'll see sidestepping of, uh, of, of, of this type of testing. Anyway, I think I've come to my time. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will now stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Gina. Thank you so much, Alka. And um, I, we saw that there were a few comments in the chat, more reflections than questions. And so I'm thinking it might be useful to turn to our next speaker, Shalene Gala, before we uh, have a, a, another break for commentary and questions by, um, by Mohit. So if I could go ahead and introduce um, Shalene. Shalene is Vice President, International Laboratory Methods for PETA. And, um, and Shalene can tell us a little bit more about his experience as a Jane, but he did grow up as a Jane as well. And he helps lead a dedicated team of scientists and researchers to modernize lab experimentation and training methods by replacing the use of animals. He was hired by PETA in 2004 and has brokered coalitions and worked on campaigns and initiatives that have led to the replacement or reduction in animal use globally um, in military pre-hospital trauma training, chemical casualty drills, intubation exercises, medical curricula, surgical training, and, and other areas. An important collaborative achievement was passing nationwide regulation, banning the use of animals for undergraduate medical training in India. And his scholarly efforts focus on the transition from animal use to human simulation models for various disciplines, including for biomedical education and military medical training. His work has appeared in peer-reviewed medical journals and he's contributed to um, books such as the groundbreaking one called Animal Experimentation, Working Towards a Paradigm Change. Before coming to PETA, Shalene received a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis. And so I'd like to turn it over to Shalene to give us his presentation. Thank you, Shalene. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and let me know if y'all can see it. Yep. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. Um, Jai Janendra. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, here with you today to speak with all of you. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Gina and also my fellow panelists um, for working together to um, put this important event together. Um, thank you also, Gina, for that great introduction. Um, so as she mentioned, my name is Shalene Gala. And as uh, she mentioned also, I grew up in a Jain household. Um, I attended Patshala as a child, I got good grades. I was uh, planning on becoming a doctor, um, but I had uh, a small yet significant life-changing experience um, earlier uh, after college. And my life uh, decided to take me down a different route. It was a, a different yet very rewarding career path that led me to understand the broader scope of Ahimsa in all aspects of life. Um, so not just being veg, and in my case, vegan for the past 18 years or so, um, but understanding how the products that we use every day uh, come to market and what goes on behind closed laboratory doors during their development and testing um, and how millions upon uh, millions of animals are suffering every year because of this. Um, so this awakening led me to PETA where um, for the last 17 years, I've, um, I've gotten a lot older and I've grown more gray hair, uh, but I've also had the, you know, the absolute privilege of being able to work with my colleagues to help wake up industry and uh, governments and academia around the world about what's happening to animals in laboratories and uh, to make the scientific and moral and legal case for replacing animal tests um, with more effective and ethical and uh, economical non-animal testing methods. Um, so I only have a few moments to speak with you. So I wanted to I'll keep things as brief as possible um, and try to focus on the areas where we at PETA have been making significant progress um, to get animals out of laboratories. And hopefully it'll give you some hope that we all um, have the power to help create some positive change for animals. Um, okay. So um, in a general scope, there are more than 111 million animals um, who are being used in tests each year, just in the United States alone. Um, animal tests are conducted for a whole you know, variety of di different things, including pharmaceuticals, um, household products, um, industrial chemicals, um, cosmetics, uh, biology lessons, 
medical training, uh, curiosity-driven experimentation, and even you know ridiculous things like making health claims for marketing beer and chocolate and even ramen noodles. Um, PETA has been taking on all of these uh, various areas to help create change and get animals out of laboratories. But the food testing area is one that my colleagues and I work on that is especially egregious in that thousands of animals, including uh, dogs and monkeys and rabbits and pigs, uh, hamsters, mice, rats, and even chimpanzees, in some cases have been forced to endure these really crude tests that um, just so that food marketers can uh, attempt to persuade consumers to spend money on their products. And in these food and beverage industry experiments, animals um, have undergone a whole variety of different procedures. Some of them include being restrained in tubes. Um, they've been hung by their tails, uh, you know, forced to run on treadmills. Um, they've been made to stand on hot plates. They've been force fed and starved. Um, they've been injected with chemicals and drugs, um, alcohol and cancer cells. They've been uh, made to swim until they're exhausted and also to inhale smoke. Um, they've been made to endure the exposure of their nerves um, and become electrocuted. Um, they've been given facial lacerations. They've been infected with harmful bacteria or viruses. Um, they've been killed by suffocation or neck, neck breaking, um, after which they were then dissected. So, and the, the list kind of just goes on and on. So as you can see, it's not a pretty picture at all. And PETA has been taking this on in a big way globally. And um, I'd like to show you just a short video of the progress that we've been making in this area and the dozens of companies that have now ended um, these cruel animal tests after discussions with our science team. Um, I do wanna um, just interject that there is one uh, part in the video that is a, a bit graphic. Um, so if you're sensitive to that, please do feel free to look away. Um, so there's another area that I'll briefly mention that um, we work on uh, reforming, and that's biomedical education. Um, so hands-on skills training in biomedical education has traditionally relied on the use of more than uh, 9 million live vertebrate animals every single year, just in this country alone. And more animals are used in other countries around the world. Um, this ranges from performing minor surgical manipulations and pharmacological interventions to also managing uh, major traumatic gunshot wounds and burn injuries and even dismemberments. Um, based on a whole confluence of different factors, um, this has included PETA supporters and others um, speaking out for decades, uh, growing concern about the animal use in invasive and deadly laboratory experiments, um, technological advances in medical simulation fields, um, the heightened uh, institutional financial constraints, and also educators' need for better teaching and assessment tools um, there's been a paradigm shift that's been taking place that's been taking place um, that's has seen the full replacement of animal use in medical school curricula and biomedical skills training programs in various countries, um, along with significant reductions and replacements of animal use in comparable uh, military training drills. So medical students in the US have historically participated in classroom animal laboratories. Um, such as injecting pharmaceuticals into live dogs to observe um, adverse side effects and also performing invasive procedures on live pigs. And following sustained campaigns by PETA and also our good friends at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, um, in 2016, every single medical school in the US officially ended their animal use for undergraduate medical training. 
And so the, instead of using animals, they're now using things like didactics, uh, task trainers, virtual reality, cadavers, um, computer, computer software, advanced human patient simulation models, and also supervised clinical work. Um, and the transition of medical education to non-animal training methods is not limited to just North America. So as Gina mentioned, um, for decades, the Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery or MBBS programs at medical colleges in India um, had required students to perform pharmacology and physiology experiments on approximately one and a half to two million live animals every, every single year. And these included uh, administering drugs to rabbits' eyes and then measuring the effects of stimulants and depressants on mice, um, dissecting live frogs and exposing their hearts to various drugs, um, also isolating guinea pigs' uh, small intestines to observe the response to administered drugs. But all of this started to change back in 2012, which is when the Medical Council of India, which until recently has been the apex medical education regulator in that country, amended its regulations to require the use of computer-assisted learning or um, CAL software to fully replace uh, the use of animals for physiology and pharmacology training in the MBBS curricula. And then similarly, um, the Pharmacy Council of India and the Dental Council of India also directed an end to animal use for training purposes in their respective disciplines as well among their member colleges. Um, and then further, the University Grants Commission in India banned the use of animals for dissection and training purposes, and that spared nearly 19 million animals annually who otherwise would have undergone invasive and terminal procedures in university life science, um, pharm pharmacy, and zoology courses. So all of these developments in India followed really major advocacy campaigns that were led by our affiliate, uh, PETA India, as well as other regional partners in that area. Um, and then I also just wanted to briefly touch base on PETA's um, major decades long effort to reform military medical training. Um, so during the military's uh, so-called live tissue training or trauma training, um, instructors will attempt to mimic human combat injuries by inflicting damage on live pigs and goats. Um, this includes things like gunshot wounds and limb fractures, um, propane torch burns, um, laceration, and even hemorrhage so that students can attempt to identify the injury and then practice proper treatment procedures. Um, nothing really moved the needle forward for animals more than disturbing video footage showing how animals are used in these courses are abused. Um, so in April of 2012, PETA had released an eyewitness investigation of a Coast Guard trauma training drill. And in this video, instructors were seen cutting off inadequately sedated goats legs with tree trimmers um, they would slice into their abdomens and pull out their organs and then stab them with scalpels. Um, and this is while the animals were moaning and kicking. Um, and then in 2015, Peter released another eyewitness investigation. And this time it was of Deployment Medicine International, which until recently was the self-proclaimed um, single largest trainer of US military forces in operational medicine. And this video footage shows live pigs who had been shot in the face and uh, instructors cutting into the animals to induce bleeding. Um, so these powerful uh, PETA investigations, along with um, our numerous protests, um, complaints uh, that we filed with government officials and even a congressional inquiry, uh, helped prompt several key policy changes regarding medical training in the military. Um, let's see. So for example, in 2014, the US Coast Guard um, cut its use of animals for life tissue training by more than half after they met directly with PETA. And then in 2017, after receiving a, a bipartisan letter from dozens of members of Congress, um, reinforcing the need to make a full and permanent ban on life tissue training, um, the US Coast Guard made history by becoming the very first branch of the US Armed Forces to fully end all use of animals for life tissue training in favor of human simulation models, which was really great. And the last thing I just wanted to mention was um, the animal testing problem that we are all facing collectively um, is it's a massive problem. It's global. It's largely secretive. It's filled with um, many entrenched interests and it's well financed to the tune of billions of dollars annually. Um, the only way for our flawed system of research to modernize and embrace non-animal technology is for people like you and me to really just be courageous enough to speak truth to power. Um, there's, in my opinion, there are only 
two ways that people can come at this issue. One is either out of fear or the other is out of love. Um, so as children, we instinctively know that hurting animals is wrong and most people will choose to hug and play with animals. Um, but as an adult uh, working in an animal testing laboratory, this instinctual relationship of compassion that you know to be true from your core is being subverted out of a fear of changing the research paradigm to such a degree that instead of playing with and loving animals, experimenters are instead um, continuing to cut, op cut them open and kill them, which has been done for decades. Um, so as part of the animal rights and Jane communities, we can make compassionate, loving choices in our everyday lives to um, buy vegan products that are not tested in animals. We can donate to charities that only pursue uh, non-animal research. We can uh, introduce uh, animal-friendly corporate shareholder resolutions. We can sign petitions and we can protest cruel injustices done, on, done onto animals and all the other ways that Alka had mentioned as well for getting involved. Um, but the bottom line is that the more public education that we do, the more corporate and political outreach that we do, uh, the more discussion of the failings of animal testing that we do, all of this will help to turn the tide by gradually uh, changing hearts and minds. Um, and so with that, that's the end of the presentation. So thank you all very much for your, your time.